Chocolat Chocolate Masters Hangout, where we'll be talking about chocolate by design. My name is Alicia Krupp from Ecole Chocolat, and today we welcome Melissa Coppell of Atelier Melissa Coppell. Hi, Melissa. Hi, everyone. <laughs> A beautiful chocolate can stop us in our tracks, and when that beautiful chocolate is also perfectly made and tastes fabulous, then you really have the trifecta of fine chocolate. But how do chocolatiers bring all those elements together and how do they do this consistently each and every time? Today we're going to be talking with Melissa, an award-winning chocolatier known for her flair for design and chocolate artistry. She's an ambassador for Cacao Berry and she was also named one of the top 10 chocolatiers in North America by Dessert Professional Magazine, so we know that we're in expert hands. We'll be talking about where her inspiration comes from and how to make that vision a reality through recipe development and production. So let's get to our discussion. Uh, so, Melissa, we're going to start from the outside of the chocolate and work our way in. Um, you're known for the stunning designs that you create for your chocolate. Um, they range from things that are quite simple to more intricate, some natural quality. Um, is the eye for architecture and design part of your background? No, no? not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> so where does the inspiration for your designs usually come from? Um, this is something I think you develop over the years. Uh, I think that once, when you start uh, doing this, uh, you tend to inspire yourself for the works of people that you admire, uh, which is perfectly fine, but there's gotta be a way of little by little creating your own personal style. And it's not something easy by any meaning, but it should be our, um, our goal. So it, it really, I think that over the years, I've been really trying really hard to detach from uh, inspirational uh, or things that are outside of me and trying to go inside and just inspire myself from within, from experiences, from uh, places that I've been to, colors that I like. And, um, and that's kind of like how I would describe my, my inspiration. Yeah. So do you typically start with a design and then find a flavor that matches your artistic vision and then that guides the recipe or does the recipe usually inspire the design or is it a bit of both? That's a very good question and I think it's a very tricky one because no, it's uh, I'll never have the design and then after work on the flavor, it's the other way around. Uh, in reality, I know that nowadays what is really extremely important is the look of things. And uh, with social media being so important nowadays, people focus way too much on the look of things. And that being said, it's not that I don't, I do in a lot, but for me, the main thing is the flavor. So that's where I work the most and that's where I start. So to give you an idea, uh, when I'm, you know, I have a new inspiration for a bonbon, what I'll do is um, I make the recipe itself and I make it in a shell that has no, no, no uh, spray, no decoration, nothing. It's just plain chocolate. Mm -hmm. I work my bonbon, I'll try it. I, you know, and, and the reason why it's because um, if you have something that looks already beautiful, you're not going to be very objective about it. So you're going to already love it before you try it. Uh, and that really, you know, it will lack a lot of objectivity at the end. So in order for you to be objective with your own product or even give it to people if you believe you have a group of friends or professionals that you, you know, uh, trust in their palate and so on in their opinion, you'll give it to them and it's going to be the same thing. They're going to think it's beautiful. They're going to try it. They're not going to be objective. So that's why I work the other way around. Uh, once I'm satisfied with the feeling, um, then I'll start thinking of how can I, you know, make the decoration and usually has a reflection of what's inside. Uh, not necessarily something very obvious that if it's strawberry it has to be red. I don't really work that way. Um, I really have to feel it. There's something that it's kind of difficult to explain, but it's something that it, for me represents the feeling. Right. That's such an interesting point that you, uh, you know, you don't want people to be wooed by the beauty of the design before you have the flavor just right. That's, that's definitely um, an interesting uh, 
process point in terms of your development for your products. Um, it's also been really interesting to watch um, the growth in the use of color to decorate chocolate. So for example, we know a lot of people um, are spraying or painting molds with um, colored cocoa butter, but that's only really been happening for about 10 years. Um, so what are your favorite techniques to incorporate color into your designs and why? Uh, that is uh, something that it's it's um, it's very interesting to talk about and it's what I try to transmit when I teach classes uh, Color is extremely important, but as the same way it can be your best friend. It can be your worst enemy um, Developing a, a feeling for color uh, It's something that it's extremely important um, So I do use a lot of color, but if you actually I don't know if through the pictures you can really feel it, I guess you do, but mostly when you see them in person. Mm -hmm. All my creations are in a way subtle in color, even though there's color. Um, so you have to start understanding pigments and you have to start understanding colors in a different way. You don't talk as green as a general color. Uh, there are several tones of green. Of course, I use, you know, for me, you know, I use Chef Robert cocoa butter and I have to know the range very well what is the final look that I want? Do I, do I want something that it's uh, almost see-through, that I can see the chocolate behind? So you can work with pigments that way. And also, like what I'm saying, like when things are obvious, are not interesting, and for me, are not pretty. And this is something very personal. So it's not so much people get so crazy about trying to do these um, intricate designs that I do, but it starts with understanding color, understanding pigments, and being able to spray even. Uh, that's the first step. So it's kind of trying to run before you actually like do your first steps. So things have to be one thing at a time. Uh, so it took me several years mass producing bonbons for my previous business, which is a wholesale company, to really get to this point where I can I feel more comfortable working with a spray gun and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Talking about the question, you know, there's so many ways that you could do. Um, so if, for example, you're using a sponge and you're doing a design with a sponge or with a little brush around the, the bonbon and you use a really intense color, then the spray tone that you're going to apply after cannot be intense. Otherwise, it's just there's a lack of balance there. So if I have a brushed uh, bonbon that has red and black, really bright, vibrant, then I'm going to put something that it's, you know, uh, white. That and That's another point that I have to uh, say it's you can really ruin your bonbons by using the use of white so for me and this is just again my personal style when you're spraying white you have to spray white combined you cannot never ever spray white directly you spray white combined with plain cocoa butter combined with white chocolate you create this really nice uh natural white so uh there's there's too many components for at the end have a good result uh, but the problem, you know, I think sometimes we, we are just uh, too nice to ourselves. We have to be a little bit more uh, critical and feel that it's never good enough and that there's always room for improvement, room to be better. And that's how I, that's why I get a little overwhelmed when people um, like what I do, because for me, it's almost like I feel I'll never like what I do because it could always be better. And of course, it's hard to be like that. Uh, but I think that's really the key to, always keep evolving and getting better so absolutely um what do you think is the most challenging decorative technique to execute perfectly uh i think everything because in reality um everything seems simple seem very simple so and i'll tell you okay the brush technique where you have your mole you put just a little bit of of cocoa butter that is simple but to make them all similar and symmetric and beautiful is not that easy uh, then well maybe if you know, we go a little bit farther i think the tape technique which i started doing you know like five years ago um it's it's tricky that the um, when, when we go through the pictures i will explain which one but um i have a technique where you put a tape you spray and then you have to clean uh the part that you don't want black uh, and you have to push that cocoa butter towards the tape to get a second line. That technique is pretty intricate. You have to be very patient and have like, um, but for me, if you ask me, I put the same effort in every single thing and I find that 
they're all difficult in their own way just because they need to be very precise. Right. And when you're trying to do that in a mass quantity. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Even spraying, even when you're spraying 150 molds and they all have to look the same, it's already something that it's difficult. Yeah. What are some of your favorite flavors to use in recipes right now and why? Um, well, I'm from the tropics, so my favorite flavors will be like tropical fruits and I love passion fruit and um, hazelnut in the nuts is the king of for me. So I, it's kind of like not, I wouldn't say my favorite, but are the flavors that I'll never get tired of. Right. Um, so passion fruit and hazelnut will be like my top flavors. Uh, I use them a lot. I combine them between themselves because I think they go very well together or I'll just, um, so it's, I will never get tired of eating, uh, uh, you know, hazel praline. On the other hand, right now, my favorite bonbon, um, I'm making a few that I really like. There's um, one that it's like a creme brulee bonbon that I really enjoy. It's like a custard vanilla and it has like crushed uh, bitter chocolate, uh, bitter caramel crystals folded in. I really enjoy eating that one. Uh, I have a black uh, sesame praline with a lime coconut caramel that I enjoy. So, I, but, but those, I feel they have their, their time and then they're kind of, you know, I, I'll, I'll forget about them and I get tired of them. But hazelnut and, for me and, and passion fruit are the best. Right. Those all sound amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we have some photos uh, to share with the audience of a few of the bonbons you've created recently. So um, why don't we just sort of talk about each one and you can tell us a bit of, of the story about the design and the recipe. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So um, in the picture, it's um, when we talk about uh, creativity, it's interesting to say that creativity doesn't mean to put strange ingredients together. Uh, that really is actually the opposite. Uh, to be creative is actually to grab very simple things and usual things, flavors that we all love and give them a twist in a, in a, in a nice way, in a different way. And that's much more difficult to grab the salt from the Himalayas with the flour from the Amazon and making this weird concoction that doesn't make any sense. So this is a good example. It's uh, my take on uh, white s'mores. Um, so that's what I was saying earlier, like the, the, there's a lot of vanilla bean inside in the, in the actual ganache. So uh, I thought, why not try to spray with actual vanilla beans? So that's what I did. Uh, the first spray on that bonbon is actually plain cocoa butter with vanilla bean that I spray. And after I spray the, the white that I mentioned earlier, which is white with white chocolate. And so it's the, the shell, it already reflects the center. And I know this is not a cut picture, but inside there's a vanilla marshmallow with vanilla curd ganache and a little crunch. That crunch is actually on the outside, so it stays crunchy. Uh, so it's kind of represented that, and, you know, graham cracker uh, crunch from a s'mores. Right. Awesome. Um, I, uh, I'm a little obsessed with the cut. Uh, yeah. For me, um, I actually could even say that I am always thinking more about how a bonbon looks inside than how it looks outside. Uh, and this is really a reference where I really, this bonbon kind of marks that moment where I started really incorporating my pastry background into the chocolate world. Um, so in this bonbon, I have a, a limeade ganache and it has a, ras a raspberry swirl and pieces of uh, marshmallow inside. So it's little, little cubes that I suspended over so it is a, you know, it's kind of bringing that pastry aspect to, to right. chocolate making. And that's a good point. People watching at home, you know, you don't just put the bonbon in your mouth. You have to cut it in half because... Oh, you know, don't even start with that, you know. You them to try a bonbon and put it like pop in the mouth. Uh, yeah, no. You don't yes. want to see my face after that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, this one, uh, I think it was, and it's kind of a little bit... Um, the same as the previous bonbon. This is a dessert bar. About four years ago, I was in a moment in my career where I, I was doing chocolate already for like three years and I was getting tired of it because I am a very curious person and I'll, I get tired very easily of doing the same. And I was ganache out. I was like, my life cannot be just be surrounded by just ganache and a praline and a crunch. And 
So I decided that I was going to create a line of, of products that was going to be inspired by my pastry background again. So desserts in a bar. So this one is a t uh, apple tart a ton. So it's pieces of uh, caramelized apples, some chewy caramel and a sablé on the bottom. The shelf life of this one, of course, is shorter, but I don't, I, you know, I, I think it doesn't matter. You know, you just eat it faster. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is the line that I was mentioning earlier where you have an, a, an actual, this is a boucher, so it's a four centimeter half, uh, half sphere. Uh, so it's a little bit bigger, meant to be shared. Um, so this one, the, the line, if you see the line, it's an orange line, right? So you have your bonbon, you spray black first, and then the part that looks a brass color, you have to clean the black that actually touched that part against the tape. So right. that is what I was mentioning that it's very tricky to achieve because you want that second line. You don't want it to clean it perfectly. Uh, you want to leave that little line. You remove, you, sorry, you spray the brass, then you remove the tape and you spray the, the orange. So that one is, is pretty intricate to do. Oh yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and this one is uh, playing a little bit. This one, I like this picture because it really shows how I play the, the colors of the inside with the colors of the outside. Right. So you have a yogurt marshmallow and on the bottom you have a swir like a raspberry uh, ganache. And right. the combo is a raspberry rose combo that I swirl it around so it looks very um, interesting, but it, it's, it's, it's really nice when you can see on the back, the colors are really matching. Right, oh that's beautiful. And then you do it with a cornet. So you, it's a different technique where you use a cornet to do the black first, then you fill the, the empty space on the right or on the bottom with red, and then you spray white. Right, oh, so beautiful. Mm, thank you. And this one is a, it's a, another one that um, it's funny because to create this one, um, I was really trying to achieve that cheesecake taste uh, in a ganache and it's not easy. So first I add Philadelphia cream cheese to my ganache and it was too fatty and uh, I didn't like it. Then I actually make cheese, try to blend it into my ganache, it was a disaster, it's too fatty. Um, but the taste was better, but it was just, the texture didn't work. So I end up just about, I was about to quit the idea and I decided to do a mousse inside of a, so it's a little cube. I know in the picture you can never tell the size. It's a very small cube. So I play on a real cheesecake. So it's a compote, a fresh mousse and a graham cracker cr uh, crumb on the bottom. So it's a, it's a really fun bonbon, but of course it lasts literally a few hours. Right. And the color contrast again is so nice with the. And it's very the playful. Uh, the decor, um, you know, it's a, it's an actual um, how do you call it? the magnetic mold that it's a cube. Yeah. Um, right. But then the top, I'll made a little a little plaquette that I sprinkle before it's set. You know, with those little um, you know fun funny you know, sprinkles, and I think it really there's nothing more American than cheesecake. <laughs> and sprinkles really kind of represents, you know, for me, I'm Colombian, so like we don't really use sprinkles over there much. So for me, you know, it was kind of like a, a tribute to America, and I think it turned out pretty, pretty fun. Yeah, that's great. That looks delicious. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I think that was the last one that we had. Yeah, okay. Um, so from the recipe development and design phase, how do you then translate the, that vision into a realistic final product whose recipe and production and decoration techniques can be accomplished um, in commercial production by a pastry chef or a chocolatier? So that is interesting because my first background was, okay, pr production. So I did like thousands of bonbons. And now what I do something else, which is teaching. And in reality, I can do whatever I want when I teach. Uh, right. And I can have something that takes forever to make because I'm going to make only two molds. Um, so I think when people come to my classes, they have to, I'm always talking about what would be the easiest way of, or, or what, what things I'm making that do not make any sense in a production kitchen. So it, there's going to be a combination of things, but I, I try to kind of, in reality, when I teach, I don't really focus myself on, on large scale, but I do give my feedback of how would you do it in large scale. So that is one thing. Um, in reality, yeah. I'm sorry, my dog is not very happy right now. <laughs> so in reality, what you're trying to, to do, um, it's, 
there's gonna be a thing, something that is very important, it's the shelf life. That is, for me, once you decide to become a chocolatier and you wanna sell your products, the first thing is to be responsible about it. So it's not so much trying to get these crazy ideas, but really make a really nice ganache that it's gonna last a long time, and not only a long time, but soft and nice to eat, not something dry that it's unedible over you know, a few days. So that's the process that I apply to everything that I, that I do, uh, regardless if it's something for me to eat, something that I'm going to publish in a magazine, something I'm going to teach you. It's always the same, very responsible, where I first think of an idea of a flavor, then I make a first test where I'm measuring uh, the taste, you know, with a combination of ingredients, and then kind of looking at my sugars and my ingredients, and I have a little device, then I make the AW uh, of the recipe, and I know how long it's going to last. So with those two things in mind, I have something that tastes good or not, uh, then something I know how long is it going to last. And then based on those two parameters, I let that ganache over a few days to see the, how, how it evolves throughout, let's say, a week, texture-wise. And then I do a second uh, test, changing depending on what I want, if it's too sweet, reducing sugars, but trying to the shelf life. You know. So it's, it's, it's pretty intricate to really work a ganache very well. Uh, and that's, I, I, I think that the way that chocolatiers should work, it's, it's not just mixing ingredients and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We have to be responsible for that. Right. And what production tips do you have for chocolatiers in order to achieve um, both efficient and consistent perfection when they're producing hundreds of bonbons at a time? Uh... Well, I think that you have to be, first of all, of course, very organized. Uh, you have to know how much, you know, each bonbon, the filling inside weights. So when you're producing your bonbons and you're making your ganaches, you're making the quantity you need, because I think there's a lot of loss when you start having a little bit extra in every single ganache that you make, either if it's bonbons, you know, uh, like molded bonbons or even, you know, uh, in the case of like things that you're cutting with a guitar, you have to make sure that the frames are the size of the guitar, otherwise you'll have a lot of scraps, uh, mm -hmm. you know, around. Uh, so those two things first, let's say I'm talking on, on the actual ganache. After being productive or not, it, it really, of course, it's, it's really how we work. So if we are hard on ourselves, like I mentioned earlier, and you really are trying to get better every day, I used to time myself. So I would be like, I have a rack, if today takes me two hours to fill it, that tomorrow has to take me an hour and a half. And I will literally put a timer by myself. No one is telling me this. It's my own business. No one cares. I will try to pipe faster, more efficient. Of course, there's a point where you already have a machine, a depositor. Uh, but uh, I think that it starts with, with basic knowledge. Uh, and it starts with pushing ourselves to be more productive, of course. Um, after, of course, freezing the bomb, is a, it's, it would be another tip that, I am not the huge fan uh, of it, but I think that you know, in the summer you should produce for your 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 you know, busy busy months like November December. Um, so those kind of things, and then when you freeze, you freeze super well wrapped in the freezer till whenever you need it. A day before you take it from the freezer, you on you don't touch, you don't unwrap, you don't do anything. You put it from the freezer to the fridge, 24 hours, and after 24 hours you can mold, you know open your box and they're gonna be perfect. So. I think those would be the tips that I kind of think about right now. Yeah. And you are also writing a book. So tell us more about uh, the book and why, do you, why you decided to write it. So uh, the book is a little bit on hold right now. Uh, and I'm going to tell you right now, I did start it and I'm, you know, it's, it's something that I really, you know, gives me a lot of, you know, uh, it's, it's really my dream. Uh, but at the same time, now that I just have my own business and I'm trying to travel around teaching and I teach here and I have a daughter and I have all these things going on, I, I felt like I was not giving 100% of myself to the book. So I was, I start, I start kind of full time. Uh, then little by little, I start kind of, uh, you know, so I'm kind of, I have it there. Uh, but I think that my business itself has to have, you know, I have to build a little bit of a team and I have to, so I keep the, the research part I haven't stopped it. Uh, what I have stopped is the, you know, the writing part, uh, which for me uh, is extremely important. So 
there is a lot of, uh, and I will ask you this, what does it mean to be a good professional? To be a good professional is someone that is technically correct, but mostly a good person. Uh, and that has to shine through your, your words. Uh, so for me, if I'm going to write a book, it's not going to be a technical book where I'm going to teach you how to make a perfect line and that's it. My, you know, my own feelings and my own, you know, my own spirit has to be in the book. That's why, you know, I could just have someone writing my recipes and I, I'm doing the test and that would be easy to do a book in a year or two uh, or six months for some people, you know, uh, whip it up like that. But my presence have to be in the book, my essence, if, if you wish, you know. Uh, so that's why I have to give myself 100% to the book. So that, like, that's why it's a little bit on hold. But it's something that is really my dream and I hope, you know, in two years or so will be out. That's great. And is the audience for the book more professionals or more home cooks or both? Or what was your kind of... Um, uh, the same way. And the reason why I stopped producing, you know, you have to route. So you can... Uh, dedicate yourself to produce a lot of almonds and make money or you can teach and uh, teaching really doesn't make you know doesn't make you a millionaire for sure uh, but what I understood is that I, I feel and this is gonna sound a little kind of weird out there but it's it's really how I feel it um, I think that my purpose in life is something else so I think that the way the, re the reason why I teach is to inspire people um, not to give good recipes or good tips. That's not, if it was that, and if I felt that's the reason why I'm teaching, I would stop tomorrow, actually today. Um, what I like is to inspire people, and especially women, you know, uh, that it is possible, that you just have to have a dream and you have to just keep fighting really strong to get it. Uh, life is very short. So it's the same with a book. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm just writing a book to inspire people. Uh, and I hope it's for all audiences. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. Right. Well, we'll be very excited when it comes out. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Do you have any uh, new bonbons in the works? And are you able to give us any hints about things you're playing with? Yeah, actually, there's a lot of things going on right now. Uh, Cacao Berry just released a new coverture, which is like, uh, you know, we've, we've been all waiting for it, which is a caramelized white chocolate ganache. It, mm -hmm. Coverture, sorry. Um, so for them, I have to develop a, a few bonbons. So um, I can give you already a hint of what I'm doing uh, mm -hmm. for them. So I'm I'm kind of working on a pecan pie. I've done a pecan pie before, but a little bit different. This time, I'm really working with like the background uh, or, or the flavors around this this caramel. It's called Saphir caramel, thirty five percent. Um, so the idea is to have a ganache that is really soft and creamy and it tastes like dulce de leche because that's kind of like the profile of the, of the, uh, coverture. And then I have a pecan praline that has like, a, the actual, um, crust folded in. Um, uh, so that's kind of like what I'm working on right now. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I have two new bouches, if you wish, um, that are really, you know, one is really European. So it's the Sacher Tort. Uh, so it's a, it's a chocolate sauce. Like it actually has a, a chocolate sauce that when you cut is really liquid. Uh, it has a, a really nice raspberry ganache and a biscuit on the bottom, really moist. So it really like, and then a, a dark chocolate a shell. So when you bite into it, it really reminds you of that Sacher, moist Sacher that it's really amazing. And the other one is more a take on a my Latin flair, you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, I confit um, some uh, pineapple um and actually i do a cold confit if you wish i make my own term so it might for a french it might not be the correct term <laughs> but i do some caramel powder and then after i put my fresh pineapple in it in two days or at least 24 hours in the fridge it almost cooks it but in cold uh and i put some uh lime zest in it to freshen up and a little citric acid i folded that into a caramel and I have a sable on the bottom, like a um, marcona almond sable on the bottom. So you have this kind of like pineapple upside down tart kind of idea into a, a boucher. So those are kind of like what I'm kind of working right now. Um, so yeah, I'm always, always, nev I never stop. <laughs> I'm sure you are, that sounds fabulous. <laughs> thank well, you, thank it's been, you. It's been so lovely to talk to you today, Melissa. Thank you so much for giving, uh, giving of your time and uh, definitely your, um, your passion for chocolate, your passion for perfection, your passion for inspiring, that all just 
comes through in uh, in speaking with you. So that's just been so um, it's been so nice to be able to share that with um, with our audience. Thank you so and I much know, for the invitation. It's really my honor. Oh, thank you. I mean, and that's also something, you know, that we um, value as well as being able to inspire people. So I think that's definitely something that we share. So it was so nice to be able to talk to you about that. And um, if uh, anyone missed um, our live hangout today, um, we'll be posting the video on our website, uh, com, shortly. And uh, thank you again, Melissa. And thank you uh, everyone for watching and thank you too for hosting me. And thank you, Robert, for all your... Robert, as always. And thank you everyone for watching. Mm -hmm. Bye.